Welcome to the March or Die show. Thank you for joining me today and looking forward to an excellent conversation. Uh, so excited to get into this. I'm not going to take a lot of time leading up to it. I do want to remind you, though, and I try to remind you every week because I know we forget or you're traveling. You don't have a chance to write it down. You forget when you get into whatever else you're doing. I do want to remind you, if you are uh, interested, please jump over to my YouTube channel, and you can find that by searching Jeremy Stallnecker on YouTube. I've got social media, I think, on just about every platform. spend most of my time on Instagram. I write a blog. You can find all of that if you are just wanting to go to one place at jeremystallnecker.com, jeremystallnecker.com, and uh, you can find the YouTube channel link there. You can find uh, links out to all of our social media, to the organization that I represent, the Mighty Oaks Foundation. You can find where I write on the blog right Right there. So that's all there, jeremystallnicker.com. Please take some time to jump over to that. Uh, today's conversation, again, is one that I want to get to and I'm excited to share with you. Uh, years ago, seems like a million years ago, sometimes it seems like only yesterday, but uh, a couple of years ago, uh, when I was in college, I got to know a lot of great people who have gone on to do some great things with their lives. One of the people that I got to know in college, we went to college together, we lived on the same hall for a while, and uh, we've kind of kept in touch uh, loosely from a distance over the years, uh, a guy by the name of Treg Spicer. Uh, Treg has uh, served in a number of capacities ministry-wise, he's done a bunch of stuff in his life, he's now pastoring a church and doing a fantastic job. Uh, he is a guy who, though, <laughs> in the midst of ministry, has dealt with some incredible challenges. I think one of the, the funny things about people's perception of those in ministry is that they believe somehow that if you serve in ministry, if you're in full-time ministry, meaning you're being paid to uh, pastor a church or work at a church, your life is somehow enchanted. You're out of touch with what the rest of the world is going through. When I started thinking about uh, guests for this show, and I've been uh, thinking about guests for a long time, of course, but uh, one of the people I wanted to reach out to was Treg, because he is a guy who serves God, who serves in ministry, and has faithfully for a long time, but has dealt with some challenges in life that could have <laughs> uh, taken him out of ministry, uh, that could have caused him to turn his back on what he believes to be true or to lose the faith, a, a term that we use and can't always define, but we say lose the faith or walk away from the faith. And yet in the face of tremendous difficulties, he has done none of those things. He has maintained his faith. He has continued to be faithful and he's encouraged so many. I'm one of the people that he has encouraged and uh, I wanted to bring a conversation with him to you. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Treg Spicer. Treg Spicer, thank you so much for joining me all the way from uh, Missouri, right? You're West Virginia, Morgantown, West Virginia, West Virginia, yeah, West Virginia man, Missouri, farther than Missouri. Yeah. <laughs> it's all it's all east of California, so that's whatever. It, that's it. That's it. Oh, more man. mountains here. Uh, so uh, we a uh, long, long time ago. It doesn't seem that long um, in my mind because I still feel okay. young, but uh, it's been a few years. We went to college together, yep. and uh, actually lived um, on the same hall for a while. And uh, man, life I think went a different direction for both of us than we thought it would. Um, but that's what makes life interesting, I guess. So let's let's start there. Tell us your story, how you kind of grew up, how you got into ministry, and um, what brought you to the church ministry that you're part of right now. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so um, growing up, it's just kind of a, a unique story. We I grew up on a farm, 40 acres, out in the middle of southeastern Ohio. It was my brother and I. My mom, she didn't drive. She didn't have her license, so we were we were miles from everybody. And that's kind of how we grew up 45 minutes from the closest grocery store. Um, I remember the first time I ever stepped into a shopping mall, I was in the fifth grade. <laughs> I was like, man, what, what is this? This is amazing. You know, as we had our, our little convenience stores and, and that's what I was used to. And then just through, just through the Lord, um, we ended up at a church and there was an older couple in this church. Actually, the whole church was older couples. We were the youngest family there. And they just saw the potential of my parents as young Christians. So they kind of took them under their wings, discipled them, and, and started to help them grow. Because the church wasn't teaching the word, but it was, you know, out in the middle of no man's yep. land. This was all we had. And so they just saw the hunger mom and dad had for the word. So started to disciple them. 
And, and through that mom and dad started to grow spiritually. Yeah. And then about 30 minutes away, there was a church that was being planted that this couple that was discipling my parents found out about. And they started to attend that church with this couple. We started to go reluctantly. Uh, long story short, then from there to um, a Christian school. And now these are things that I, I'm, I'm hearing things and being taught things that I've you know, never heard in my right. life. Right. And but I'm I'm growing in my love for the Bible and I'm in Bible class and this is so unique for me. And, you know, I'm really enjoying just the, the scriptures. And so even as a kid, that's what that's what I liked. I like Bible class and science class. I could do away with anything else in school. Those are my, <laughs> my two subjects. So I thought, man, if I go on to college, that's what I want to study. And I know that that I fought that, you know, 16, 17, 18 years old. I'm going to you know, I'm going to go into medicine. I'm going to go into medicine and then I'll just teach the Bible when I right. go to a church one day and 18 God got a hold of my heart and I surrendered to just to go into the ministry and to follow the Lord in that. And so went off to Bible college then and had a good time. Yeah. Oh, Bible, Bible college is a good time. I think we both yeah. would say yeah. some of the yeah. great four years of our lives sure. um, and really enjoyed that made lifelong friends while I'm here with you now and, and thankful for that opportunity. And so went off, went off to college, graduated, went back to the ministry um, that I went to the Christian school and was there 11 years. Wow. And through a series of circumstances, the Lord led us uh, to North Carolina. And so was there in Greensboro, North Carolina and working in the ministry there. Enjoyed, enjoyed what we were doing, working with students. And we had a big Christian school, about 800 kids and just, just coaching and, and working with them. That was, you know, I loved that. Yeah. That was right up my alley. And while I was there, though, um, took 2013, I had a trip to Africa. And while I was there in Africa, the Lord was just really getting a hold of my heart just for it's OK. It's time to transition out of assistant student ministry. And, you know, it's time to go into senior ministry as I was working with adults there and teaching and discipling and, you know, working in uh, some prison ministries. And, OK, it's time for me to make this step, you know, into full time. So I came home and told Carrie, listen, I don't know what's going to happen. But God's starting to stir me yeah. that it's time to transition, you know, into a into the full time pastorate. So we started to pray about it, and it was in I'm trying to think March of the next year. So just a few months later, my wife's pastor growing up called me and said, "Listen, I'm going to retire. I want you to come and take over the ministry." And of course, we were praying what the Lord wanted, and sure. we we just didn't know. So it was you know, hey, this is what the Lord would want. Yep. And so started to went up, candidated, knew this is what God wanted, and packed our bags and moved to Morgantown, West Virginia. Wow! Um, from from Greensboro, quite you a transition. Well. But man, you just when you're doing what you know God wants you to do, whether you like the geography, the location, whatever it is, you know, okay, this is where I need to be. Yeah. And I knew without a shadow of a doubt, this is where we needed to be. And so we came up, worked together for a couple of years. He had cancer. He was 77. He was the founding pastor. Wow. And so at 49 years of ministry and at 79 years old, he retired. Incredible. And so now I'm the second pastor to, to pastor the church. Wow. And it's been, it's been great. It's been a great transition. You know, a lot of people was good luck, Trey. You know, you're going to be the scapegoat, you know, <laughs> take it over from someone like that. Sure. You're in trouble. But we, I mean, it's just, we've not had any issues. Uh, the church has loved us. And my wife was born here. She was raised here. So that helps. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's just been great. It's been a great transition and and the ministry is going well and we love our people, love what we're doing. And so it's been good, um, you know, but it's, it's kind of like, I'm thankful. I know this is where God wants us Yep. because man, it's just been, it's just been trial after trial can, since, can we, we've, since we've arrived. It seems like, can we talk about how you know before we talk about the trials, because you're absolutely yeah. right. I think if you know you're where God wants you to be, then you can deal with an awful lot. Uh, right. But the question comes up a lot in ministry, and you worked with uh, with you know teenagers for a long time. Yeah. Um, but even adults have the same question. When people talk about God's moving in my heart or God's working in my life or God's leading me a different direction, right. um, it sounds very spiritual but there's a very real aspect of that that would cause you and a lot of other people to move their families from a place that's comfortable to go somewhere that is uncertain. Can you talk about that a little bit? What do you mean when you say God was working in my life, God was moving in my life? What were some of those uh, things that he was using to show you where he wanted you to be? Sure, Jeremy, you know, and it is, it's, and that's, 
I think that's one of the hardest things in the Christian life is to know. Yeah. You know, the ways of a man are right in his own eyes, but God weighs the heart. Sure. So how, how do I know this is God or how do yeah. I know this is me? You know, should, should Elimelech and, and Naomi ever gone, you know, to Moab, Abraham going to Egypt, was that the right call or was that man's decision? Sure. So with us, you know, we were in Ohio, we were there 11 years and, and, and we knew things were, things were not going the direction we thought. So we knew it was time to go. But the question then was, where do we go? Yeah. Yeah. And is, is this the right place to go or do we, is, do we leave or do we just continue to stay? And so in that situation, I told, I told my wife, listen, I'm not going to make any decision until God confirms it in scripture. So we just, I said, as we read our Bibles every day, let's just ask God to use the word of God to direct us. And I was there in Ohio. I was going to take over the ministry. That was the plan. And it just, it hadn't happened in 11 years and I, I didn't see it happening anytime soon. And so it's time to move on. But she was definitely not ready. Yeah. And yeah. So I'm reading, I'm in Isaiah, my Bible reading, and God, God, you know, has Isaiah 55. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. And then it says, go thy way, depart in peace. So I highlight it, you know, my Bible, and I set it up on the kitchen counter and I go off to work and I'm like, there it is, Carrie, there it is. <laughs> and so I call her, I'm like, do you get, do you see my verse? She's like, yeah, but I haven't got mine yet. I'm not convinced we got to go. And, and she literally, she'll tell you in her testimony, she stopped reading the Bible for a little bit because she mm. didn't want. And I said, Hey, if God confirms that we should stay, yeah. I'll stay. Yep. And, and so she was doing her Bible reading. It was late one night and, and she woke me up. I was asleep. She's like, Hey, I got my verse. I'm like, okay. I didn't know if this was going to be a verse to stay a verse to go. Sure. I didn't know what was coming. Yeah. And she read me Galatians 110. Do I persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? If I seek to please men, I'm not the servant of Christ. Wow. She said, the only thing holding me back is what people are going to think of us. If we leave, Wow. she says, I've been a servant of men this time. I've not been a servant of Christ. We've got to go. So then we pack up and we move away from family, away from everybody hey, we've got scripture to come back on. Yep. You know, and then in Greensboro, I call it God shaking the tree. Hmm. It wasn't that I wasn't content where I was, but you just saw God working in my heart. And, and, and you, just, you know, if you delight thyself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. Yeah, right. So for the first time, I'm desiring, you know, working with adults. And I'm, I'm desiring, you know, leading ministry. You know, yeah. I'm desiring this. That's what I mean. From the time I graduated, I never thought I'd be an assistant, but that's just where God had me for 16 years. So as God's shaking that tree, I started to pray, okay, God, I've got, I've got four little guys. I've got mm -hmm. a great family, yep. you know, two boys, two girls. I just, I just want you to put us where we're needed. And so I just started to pray specifically, God, put us where we're needed. I just don't want to go into a ministry because they, they want a pastor. I want to go into a ministry because they need a pastor. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was candidating for one. It was a great church. We could see ourselves there. The pastor was going to retire. He just didn't know when. So, you know, even though we were thinking, man, this could be it, it wasn't where we were needed. Sure. And then I'll, I'll never forget. I was out mowing the grass and Carrie got a phone call from her best friend who's still in the church, who's now our secretary. And she came out in the backyard and I'm mowing. And she's like, I just got a phone call from home. Uh, pastor Moran has cancer. The assistant pastor's left. The college pastor's left. He's by himself. He's going to have to have surgery, chemo, radiation. The church doesn't know what they're going to do. Wow. And he had already talked to me previously about the possibility of coming. But again, he's like in two years, you know, I'll let you take over. I'm like, well, you don't need me, you know? Yeah. But when I heard that news, it was God answered that prayer. I mean, who can step into a church and kind of take over from a man that has been there 47 sure. years yep. Yep. And, and, and fill that role and not be an outsider. Well, we could, we, cause we were there on the holidays, everybody knew us. Yep. And so God just said, there's, there it is. So yeah. God answered that prayer. So for me, it's specifically prayer, seeking the word and, and then watching God, watching God do that. Yeah, that's great. There's a great yeah. piece that comes from that as well. And I, I think, you know, if you rush out in front of God or, uh, you refuse to do as he leads, you're not going to experience that peace in your life. And then when difficulties do come up, you're going to start questioning, am I in the right place? Mm -hmm. Am I doing the right thing? Yeah. Um, man, that's fantastic. And and then, you know, a lot of that has led and it. It's, it's funny. People think that as Christians, if we do God's will, everything's going to be wonderful. And uh, uh, you're, 
your life there has, I'm sure, been wonderful in many ways, but it's also been full of challenges. A lot of those are extreme physical challenges. Mm. And yet in the middle of it, you've been extremely encouraging. And I've watched you from a distance. Uh, the church that you were part of in Greensboro, um, actually, my wife's family was there at the same time you were there. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. uh, you know, I heard about your family, what you guys were doing. And that was kind of an interesting thing since we had, you know, before that been in school mm -hmm. together. And so I've been following you kind of from a distance for a while, but your most recent health issues You've just been so encouraging <laughs> and so publicly <laughs> encouraging. Um, can you talk about the challenges and, you know, some of that? Talk about your family, perhaps, and how they've dealt with it. Um, even watching how your wife and your kids have responded has been an encouragement to me. Mm. And then talk about what you've held on to during that time as you've continued to press forward and continue to just do what God has called you to do. Yeah. And so it's, you know, sometimes, Jeremy, I, I, I wish I knew the answer. Mm. Uh, sometimes, okay, is this it's kind of like Job, you know, Job always trusted in the Lord, but we look back and we see where Satan had a hand in all this. And I, I look at what, what we face. And I don't know if this is just me or if this is the Lord, or if this is Satan's attack, I don't know. Right. Right. And we, we will never know probably till we get the glory. Sure. Um, but I've often said, you know, we're in West Virginia. So I got a big hill mountain on the other side of the church. And I say, you know, Satan's just, he, he doesn't have a, an arrow and a bow and arrow, you know, he's up there with a machine gun, just, just, just you know, just every day. <laughs> yeah. It's just one thing after another. Right. And, and just so, so for the listeners listening and kind of my story. So I come up to faith, you know, Pastor Moran's out for a year. And so I just kind of take everything over a church of about 150 and, and, you know, I'm working on grad work and I all in, in one, he was expecting to go into surgery and be out back to the ministry in a week. He went into surgery and came back eight months later. And so I became the pastor, the assistant pastor, the youth pastor, yeah. the Christian school administrator, yeah, just well, everything well, yeah, well. in one swoop, which was of the Lord, because that allowed me to gain a rapport with the people without being the pastor. And, and so I did that from 2014 to 2015. 2015, 2016, we kind of worked together. He was in and out with cancer. We just, I just enjoyed being with him and, you know, kind of a father, son, Paul, sure. Timothy relationship. Yeah, and sure. Obviously he married me. We've known him for, you know, wow. at that point, 15 years. Yeah. And, and so enjoyed working together there. Then I took over the ministry. He retired officially in 2016. So 2016, um, May of 2016 through 2017, you know, I told, I told the kids, they were little, um, Cammy was 10. My oldest daughter was 10. My youngest daughter at that time was five. And the boys were in the middle, seven and eight. I'm like, listen, there's going to be no vacations for a year. Dad's now the pastor. I've got to get settled in. The people need to see me, you know, preaching. You know, we'll try to get away when we can. But for a year, you got to give dad this time just to, to be at the church. It was a very stressful, <laughs> stressful year, but we made it through. Things yeah. went great. And then I'm it's, it's summertime now, 2017. I have an assistant pastor. Things seem to be going well. And I'm training for a marathon, training for Morgantown Marathon. My, my goal is to be in the top 10. Okay, that's where I plan on finishing. So I'm, you know, I'm training, doing a lot of training for this marathon. Yep. Again, things are going, going well. And it's a Wednesday night, September 17, 2017. I'm sitting at my desk. I'm discipling this young couple that just came to Christ. And as I'm, as I'm discipling them, the room started to spin a little bit. And everything from, from my neck clear down to my waist kind of went numb. I'm like, well, this is weird. So I said, hey, guys, we're just going to finish up early. You can go ahead and go. They went out. It was Wednesday night. We had a missionary from the Philippines that night. I went out and I told my wife, I said, hey, I'm not feeling well. I'm going to be in my office until the service starts. And um, so don't panic. I'm just going to be in there or in the restroom. So I'm in my office, it's, it's getting close to church time, and I feel like I've swallowed a 50 cent piece, and it's stuck right in my chest. Yeah. I can't, you know, like you swallow a pill, it's stuck, but this is like major. Yeah. And so I start beating my chest, I, I go up to the wall of my office, and I start banging my back against the wall of my office, and man, this thing will not come unlodged. I go back out to the church, I tell my wife, listen, I'm really sick, there's something stuck in here, I'm gonna have to go try to throw up to get this out, have somebody else leave the service. I'll be in the bathroom. And so I go in the bathroom, I do throw up and then I hit the floor of the bathroom. I take my shirt off. I'm laying on the bathroom floor. I'm just sweating and I'm just trying to beat whatever this is in my chest out. Well, one of our deacons was there that night. He's a doctor. 
and an, an usher came in and saw me on the floor. He ran out and got another deacon and the doctor. They came in and they're standing over top of me trying to figure out what's going on. And the doctor's like, it can't be your heart. You're running a marathon. Into it. <laughs> you know, there's no way this is your heart. Yeah. Like, I don't know, man, whatever it is, it's just stuck in here. He's like, it's got to be severe indigestion. I'm like, well, can you get me down? Because he runs the urgent cares here in town. Can you get me down to urgent care? And he's like, yeah, and I'll give you some stuff to drink. And he said, then we'll do an EKG. I get up, I go out to the car. Carrie had to run in the church and get her purse. When I got to the car, I laid down in the fetal position on the parking lot wow. of the church. Wow. I had nothing left in me. Yeah. I mean, I'm dying. My body's, I'm just, my energy's going out. I'm laying there in the church parking lot. They helped me up and in the car. He had us pull around the backside of the urgent care. We get to the backside. I walk in. I see a hospital bed open. I, I think it was in the hallway. I don't even remember. I just <laughs> lay down on it. Wow. I couldn't even get to a room. It was just, I was done. And so I lay down on that bed. Um, they they wheel me into their room there in urgent care. They put the EKG on. They had me drink it. And it's the first reading of the EKG. It was textbook heart attack. But they're not telling me that. And, and so they call the ambulance immediately. Um, they're trying to keep me calm and they just keep taking this EKG. So, uh, my buddy, my, my deacon, as the EKG is printing out, he's sending it to our hospital, you know, West Virginia university. So they're getting it. The ambulance shows up and I, they come in and wheel me up and they're, they're taking me out. And that's the first time I heard the word heart attack. Yeah. Wow. And I, wow. I'm just, I'm trying to process all this. Sure. You know? Yeah. And they gave me the the nitro and then they gave me, they gave me a shot of um, Vicodin or whatever pain medicine, because my left, I was screaming. My left arm hurt so badly. I mean, I'm just, I'm just yelling. Mm. It was like a semi truck was sitting on my arm. I, was, ah! I, was just, <laughs> I mean, it was excru people thought with their left arm going numb. Mine was just in excruciating pain. Yeah. Yeah. So they gave me a shot of pain medicine to take that away. And once the pain in the left arm started to ease up, that's when the, I realized the elephant was on the chest, you know, trying to breathe. So they get me in the ambulance and it's a, it's a four mile ride. I mean, it's maybe six stoplights to university hospital and he kept the siren on. So I'm laying there, I'm holding my chest, you know, and, and I look at the kids sitting beside me and I'm like, bro, you've got the, you've got the lights on and the siren on. How bad is this? He said, sir, you're extremely bad and you're getting worse every second. He has the they, gift of encouragement, that guy. Yeah, I know. And so I'm, <laughs> I want to fall asleep. I'm just, I'm dying. But I keep trying to keep myself awake. Uh, you know, I'm going to see Kroger soon. I'm going to see Chick-fil-A soon. I'm going to see, try to keep myself mentally awake. They, they take me into the ER. They, they make one turn and doctors on the other end of the hall start screaming, this room, this room. They, they run me down there. And there was probably 20 people in that room waiting for me. Yeah. They, they take me off of the gurney. They throw me on the, the hospital bed my shirt's already off and they put the pads on me and they take a doctor and set him right beside me holding the paddles and another doctor standing at the bottom of my bed watching my eyes and there's another doctor there he says you're you're dying and you're going to die on me any second he said i've got to have these guys here ready to bring you back the moment you die so i've got one watching my eyes waiting for me to die one waiting to shock me back to life and then the other doctors got a phone and he's talking to the cath lab. He's like, are you ready? I said, well, tell me as soon as you're ready. Are you ready? Tell me as soon as you're ready. And, and so my wife's standing there, she's crying. And I, I'm a light at the end of the tunnel. You know, this is it. I know this is it. And I remember looking at her and saying, should I call the kids and tell them goodbye? You know, this time they're 11, nine and 10 and seven. Wow. And I said, should I call them and tell them goodbye? And she's like, no, just save your emotion and everything you've got to live. And I remember sitting there, she's walking out and just, this is it. I'm done. You know, this is the last time I'll ever see my wife again. This is the last time I saw my children. And, and in the midst of all that chaos, I, you know, I don't remember anything around me. It was kind of like one of those moments. Um, and it, just the still small voice of God speaking to me, it said, why are you so fearful how is it that you have no faith? Mm. Trey, and he's, if, you were, if you were in another country right now, you would have no choice but to trust me. Why can't you trust me right here? Yeah. If you die, I've got your family. If you live, I've got this situation. I'm in control. And, and at that moment, there was just a peace. And I knew 
live or die, it's going to be okay. And the next thing I kind of remember from that was the doctor coming in, grabbing me from the cath lab. And he took me up to the cath lab himself. He said, I've never transferred a patient personally, but I can't let you out of my sight. So he came and got me with some other doctors, took me upstairs. They threw me on the table. They went in my right arm and about, it took about an hour to find the blockage because my, my left ventricle splits and they couldn't see it off the other split. So I, they finally find it. I feel this pressure in my chest. I'm like, doctor, it's worse now than it ever has been. He's like, give me a second. He's like, you're going to feel great. And so that was the balloon. They put the stent in, they let that out. And my first words were, doc, I think I can run again. <laughs> He's like, don't get in a hurry. He's like, you're going to go to sleep and I'm going to check the rest of you out. Yeah. And it, it was almost two hours. I mean, that's a long heart cath. Mm. And my wife said he came back out to the waiting room and he was drenched. He was wow. going to have to change outfits for the rest of the night because it was just so much pressure yeah. trying to, wow. you know, trying to get me well. So it was a hundred percent blockage in the widow maker and the left ventricle. And I lived four hours from seven that night, they finished up at 1130 that night. And the next morning I'm laying there in the hospital bed and doctor after doctor is coming in. And I called the nurse and I said, who are these people? I'm, I know I didn't see him last night. She said, this whole hospital cannot believe that somebody survived four hours with a widow maker. Wow. And they all want to come in and just shake the hand of the guy that survived. <laughs> and, and so that was, you know, it was, they, they didn't know how to explain it man, you were at the right spot at the right time, man. It's a good thing you're a runner or you'd have never survived that heart attack. And I'm like, hey, God's not done with me yet. Sure. You know, God's, yep. God's still got me here. And the hardest part though, Jeremy, was not that. That was kind of like, it was four hours, it was over. I was better. The hard part was two days later, I'm home. And three days prior, four days prior, I'm running 20 miles at an 820 pace. And that's an easy run for me. Now I'm walking a half a mile and I've got to stop and catch my breath. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't have the energy. I, I just, I'm, I'm just trying to adapt to this and it's just so mentally challenging, you know, knowing who I was, I mean, running was my life. I've done, I was a secondary black belt, you know, in Taekwondo, I had my own martial arts school. I ran, you know, 200 mile relays with groups of guys, marathons. This was just me. I was a go guy and all that's, nothing will be the same now, you know, and knowing that my life is going to change. It was really difficult. And I remember it was two weeks after my heart attack. And I told that, I told the kids, listen, we hadn't had a vacation yet. I'm like, we're going to Myrtle beach. You know, <laughs> it's I'm time, for vacation. Beach, time for vacation. And we're, we're at Myrtle beach. And maybe this, uh, this can relate to some of your listeners. And it was three o'clock in the morning and I wake up and I'd had a dream that I had the heart attack again. And I woke up, man, I'm sweating. I'm trying to figure out, is this real? Yeah. Is this not real? Yeah. You know, did, am I, am I having a heart attack? What do I do at Myrtle Beach if I'm having a heart attack? You know, my doctors are eight hours away and, and I, I, you know, and I'm, it's just a, it goes from that to a panic attack to, you know, it's PTSD mm. from that. Yep. near death experience. Yeah. And I, if you ask the kids, one of their favorite vacations ever, they'll go back to that trip, <laughs> but it was horrible for me. I didn't mm -hmm. sleep, you know? So, so then it started every night. I'm, I'm dreaming of the heart attack. I'm waking up, you know, is my left arm numb is, is, you know, is the weight on the chat and it's real. Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't need a hymn book. I, I, I know every hymn I've got them all memorized. <laughs> You know, I, I have Philippians memorized, First John memorized, and all that scripture and all those hymns didn't make that go away. It was just something that mentally I had to begin to figure out how am I going to deal with this? Yeah. And it went on. It went on for, for months. And what I ended up doing was every night before I'd fall asleep, I'd get a sermon ready on my phone. So I'd go to Sermon Audio or I'd go to another website and I'd pull up, you know, Mark Dever or something like that, that kind of had a soothing voice, not screaming, the other <laughs> way, but a soothing voice. And I mean, it was clockwork. I'm, I'm having a crazy dream about this heart attack. I go in the living room, I sit down, I turn on the sermon and I just try to focus on that, trying to get my mind off of all this and, and back on that sermon to fall back asleep. Well, you know, when you go through a vicious cycle like that, 
you're worthless in the day. Sure. You've been up since 3 a.m. Yep. Sleep. And, and then you're, it's, it's actually, it's depression as well. And so I'm, I'm waking up at 3 a.m. I'm there. I carry my wife's like, are you going to, you going to go to work today? I'm like, huh, I'm not going today. You're going to work today. No, nah, I'm not. I'm not going in today. I just don't feel good. It was just here. You know, it was, it was just my mind trying to deal with this. It was depression and, and, you know, no sleep and depression and just feeling sorry for myself yep. in a lot of ways. Yep. And so one of the young men in the church that I had discipled and had worked with many times called me. He's like, I want you to meet me for lunch today. And I hadn't seen anybody. I mean, this is like four, it might be six weeks later. I'm like, no, Tim, I, I don't know. He's like, no, I want you to come. I want you to come to lunch with me today. <laughs> I'm not asking. <laughs> man, I'm like, all right, man. I said, okay. Well, I remember laying on the couch thinking, I don't want to go. I'm going to call him and cancel. And I'm laying there. And I mean, just again, it's that still small voice of God that took me right to Joshua. And Joshua is laying in his tent. I, I think he was depressed too. You know, his best friend was gone. He's thrust into leadership. He doesn't yeah. think he's ready. Yeah. He knows what he's dealing with. And he doesn't want to come out of the tent. He's like me at the house. He didn't want to come. I didn't want to come out of the house. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to come out of the tent. Yeah. And what's God telling him? Get up. Get up and go over the Jordan. And I mean, just God just said, Trey, get up. It's time to get up and it's time to go. And I got up off the couch. I went and I took a shower. I got ready. I went to lunch and everything changed from that moment on. But I went back to Joshua after that and, and just kind of studied his life and the times that God told him to get up, you know, and then they lost at AI. And what's he do? He falls on his face and God says, get up, <laughs> you know? And, and so that those two words, honestly, Jeremy, were the two words that got me through the heart attack that got me through what I was facing. Yeah. It was get up. And, and so it was time to get up and go. Now, family wise, the heart attack was the hardest on the baby. You know, she was seven at the time. Well, all of them, for instance, I was studying. I don't, it was in the fall of, let me think. Yeah. It was in the fall of last year. I was at the office late on a Saturday night doing something. And my, my third Cade texts me, He's like, dad, are you okay? Do we need to come check? On you? Mm. I'm like, bro, I'm just, I'm just studying. Yeah. But in their minds, yep. You no, know, dad's at church. He's not come home yet. Yep. Is he okay? Right. And my youngest, you know, even now, if I go for a run, how far are you going to run dad? When are you going to be back? You're not running a marathon. Are you? Hmm. She has no concept of any of that other than going back to, yep. right. You know, they almost lost dad. So right. they, you know, it's still something they deal with. And, and I, I see, especially, you know, this anxiety that's there that I've caused in their lives that, you know, I have an opportunity to work with them in that, but yeah, so that's, that's the heart attack. And then the crazy thing is, and we can talk about this if you want, but we don't have to, is a year and a half later, I nearly die of Crohn's disease. Right. You and know, that's what and you've been going through very that's recently. Been my battle recently. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, and that one, um, you know, that was hard. It's, and that's where the one where the boys have had to step up and become men, you know, at 12 and 13 years old, I'm, I can't walk, you know, through that spell. Uh, I was full of infection and it's snow. The boys shovel the driveway. They're <laughs> taking the trash out there. There's time to man up. Yeah. They say, boys, I just can't do it, man. I can't walk. You're going to have to do this for your mom. Yeah. You're going to have to take care of your mom. And, and they had to grow up quicker than a lot of kids have, but you know, that's that watching them do that, though, has been a blessing Yeah. and, and seeing that happen. I just, sometimes I feel badly that they had to go through what they've gone through and dad's in the hospital, 14 days, dad's in the hospital, 10 days, dad's in the hospital, watching us play basketball, FaceTime, you know, I hated that, uh, but it was just, you know, what, nothing you can do. Yeah. You know, it's just what God this is just what God has, has for us, what God has for me. So what do you, you know, as a pastor, having gone through all of that personally and spent a great deal of time reflecting on all that, I would imagine, yeah. uh, what do you say to someone that's sitting across from your debt, uh, across from, you know, your desk and their world is falling apart, whatever that means to them? What, what do you tell them? I'm sure it's different now than it would have been five years ago, 10 years ago. Absolutely. Uh, what do you tell them? Yeah. So one 
is you're not alone. You know, despite laying in a bed by myself when everybody's at work and everybody's going their way and, and feeling like, okay, I'm, I, I'm alone. God is there. Hmm. And if we open our eyes, David said, you know, I would have fainted had I failed to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Right. So even in the midst of horrible sickness, God is there. His timing is not our timing. You know, I'm going to the doctor with my Crohn's disease every two weeks and the hospital here has no idea what to do with me. Right. And they're like, I don't know if you're going to get better. I mean, I'm down to 140 pounds. I'm crawling. I can't walk. And they're telling me, I don't know if you're going to get better. And, and through a friend of a friend, um, I get an appointment at the Cleveland clinic and I walk in there for consultation. The doctor just quote unquote, just happens to be the head of the gastro department. He just happens to be <laughs> the chair of the national Crohn's and colitis foundation, wow. <laughs> you know, and I walk into him he's like, you need to see a colorectal surgeon immediately. And I'm like, and this was a Monday. I'm like, I know, but you didn't have one available here until Friday. So I have to wait all week to see one. He's like, no, I just hired one on my team and she's coming right now. And she comes in and she looks at me and she's like, I'm so sorry. How long have you been living like this? Hmm. I said, Oh man, six weeks. She's like, you'll walk out of this hospital tonight. Wow. I just start crying. Yeah. My wife starts crying. I said, I haven't walked in six weeks. She said, I will fix this in a 10 minute surgery and you will walk out of this hospital. No, tonight. Way. no way. And she took me into surgery 10 minutes later or 10 minutes later, whatever I recovered hours later, I walked out of Cleveland clinic. The first time I'd walked in six weeks. Yeah. And, and man, I remember that night looking at myself, I took a picture because I hadn't, I haven't been able to stand up to see me. And after a heart attack, I got with a doctor, started recovery, man, I'm squatting 350 pounds. I mentioned 250 and I look in the mirror and I'm 140 pounds. Yeah. So from 180 to 140, my muscles gone. I look like a Holocaust victim. You right. Know? And I, I got that picture just as a reminder, but God just in God's timing, all that was coming. Sure. And there was delivery. Yep. I've, I'm crying out in the Psalms with David. Oh God, why, why won't you deliver me? God, why don't you hear my prayer? You know, and, and the song that, that still makes me cry today when I hear it is, you know, though he slay me yet, will I trust him? Yeah. And I sang that every morning, you know, though you ruin me, hmm. you know, I will trust your name. And that's, that's where I felt like I was. Yeah. And, and so even through the slang, even through the, just feeling like God was ruining me. I had to trust him and, and he showed himself there and, and made himself real, but it was in his time. Yeah. And so when someone's sitting there like, God has not forsaken you, you know, God will deliver, deliver you, but it's going to be in his timing and his way and, and who God makes, he's got to break. Yeah. And, and it's just not always easy. Yeah. And that principle of get up, we can't control a lot of things in life, but we can control that. You just got to get up and can. keep moving. Yeah. 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 It's, it's your podcast. It's, it's your motto. It's March or die. Yeah. And that's, it's just get up. I've got to get up and go. Now with Crohn's, there was no getting up. Right. But, but it was still that, okay, I've got to, you know, I can't let this keep me down. You know, I got to get my spirits up. I've got to, yeah. you know, keep myself going. Yeah. It's the not giving up. I guess that it's that, not giving up. That that's can right. be the get up, right? It's, it's exactly right. You know, every day it's every day is a new day. Every day you go to sleep thinking, God, please let tomorrow be better. Yeah. And it's not, but you still keep going. That's good. So we'll end with this. Um, how do you define hope and where, where does a person fi find hope or how do they hang on to hope? That's good. I, I don't want to be cliche, Jeremy, with this, but you've got to go back to the word of God. You know, you, you jump in Psalms. I, I bought what I did when I was going through my Crohn's disease where it seemed hopeless. I mean, I'm never going to walk again. Yeah. What's going to happen. I bought a journal. I just bought a journal book of Job. Hmm. And I, I think they, they sell those individually. I mean, they're only a couple dollars and the ESV does it. So I bought Job and I just opened it up and man, and the only, the only relief I could have was sitting in a hot tub. That's the only way I could really sit up without laying down. So I fill that tub up with hot water. I'd sit down in it and I would take the book of Job and I would just sit there and read and journal, read and journal. 
and, and just finding that hope through him and through God's word. And then in the book of Psalms. And then the other thing I did, and this is not spiritual at all, is being a runner, you know, yep. being a, a triathlete, I would, I would get videos of triathlon training or guys prepping for triathlons or prepping for a marathon that was on YouTube. Yep. And I would just set it up on my iPad and just sit there and just watch it. And just, you know, that was the sunshine, the training, the, the things they were going through and, and just thinking, okay, one day I'm going to, I'm going to get back to that one day, you know, I'm going to be there again. And it was just setting a goal in front of me that, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to do this again. Yeah. You know, I'm going to, I might not do an Ironman, but I'm going to, I'm going to do a half Ironman maybe one day and just having a goal like that to motivate me, to keep me going. And then spiritually just renewing myself in God's word and the scriptures. Yeah. And so I would say hope you've got to be in the word and hope you've got to set a goal and say, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to be here one day and I'm going to go for that. That's great. And, and then it's just, it's just a day at a time. You, you yeah. just think you're never going to go through it and you're never going to get through it, but God's grace is sufficient each day. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I often define hope as realizing there's something outside of the circle that I'm standing in. Mm. There's something out there. What I'm, what I'm dealing with right now is not all there is. And, uh, and that's exactly what you're talking about. It's, it's watching other people who are outside of that circle. It's understanding God has a plan outside of the circle. Yeah, yeah that's exactly uh, it. And, and, and as a pastor, just being transparent, I could not watch our live streams. It was too hard on me, you know, watching, watching my assistant preach. And even now I kind of get choked up thinking about it. I mean, that's when I was like, I'm going to quit. Yeah. I'm yeah, done. Yeah. Everybody loves him. He's a better preacher than I am. <laughs> He's young. <laughs> you know, he's, he's got the energy. I'm just this old sick guy in bed. I don't deserve to be the pastor of this church. I just want to quit. And the only way I could keep that from happening is I just had to turn that. I just had to stop. So I had to know, okay, this is not helping me. Yeah. And so I just had to, I had to turn that off. Yeah. That's good. Uh, yeah. Trey, we could talk a lot more, but where can people follow you? You do a lot of your own media. Um, I do. You record yep. videos and yep. I have a podcast. Yeah, they want to go. It just it's easy. Tregspicer.com. and I have a couple podcasts going. One is called Art of the Assistant, and a buddy and I do that together. It's it's just talking about trials. It's sixteen pastors is a sixteen years as an assistant pastor. Um, I've seen a lot, <laughs> and so Art of the Assistant. And then I just started my own um, Treg Talks, just kind of telling right. some stories and not really got into the heart and my suffering like I have with you yet, because it's not easy for me to talk about. Of course, I could count on one hand the number of times I've done it, mm -hmm. honestly. Um, so that just tells you right there, still, still hard to, sure. hard to handle or hard to grasp. But as Treg Talks, I do it. And then I, I try to get a weekly blog out if I can, but it's all right there, tregspicer.com. Awesome. And you can kind of see see me and see some pictures of the family there put a, a face to the name another amazing conversation and uh man i i didn't know exactly what to say uh, as trey got done telling his story and talking about all the things that he'd been through just so overwhelming and yet such a picture of what it is to march <laughs> when it may be easier to simply give up to throw in the towel to say i'm not doing this anymore and uh, he said for him it was that idea of getting up I, i've just got to get up I've got to get up. And often get up looks like don't give up. Uh, but in all of it, we know that what we can control emotionally, spiritually, relationally, sometimes even physically, is just putting one foot in front of the other. Maybe we don't know how we're going to get over there, but we're going to take the next step. And uh, I appreciate Treg and his transparency telling that story. Uh, he talked about how difficult it is to tell this story and uh, still dealing with a lot of that. And I appreciate him sharing that with us. Please take some time, if you will, to go over and check out his website, tregspicer.com. And uh, you'll learn some great information about him there. You'll see pictures of his family, but also connections to or links out to uh, the other stuff that he does. And uh, I know that'll be a blessing to you. Check that out and look forward to uh, to talking to you next time. And I will remind you, we talked about this this whole episode, but I'll remind you one more time before we end today that in life, things do get difficult. Often the, the rounds are coming your direction. The mortar uh, rounds are falling around you. Things are exploding. They're out of control. You don't always know why. But when it happens, you only have two choices. You can stay where you are and die. That's a decision we can all make. Or you can march, putting one foot in front 
of the other. And thankfully, although you cannot control everything in your life, you can make that decision. Will you march or will you die? The choice is always yours. Thank you. We'll talk to you next week.